Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar. My name is Carrie Mokowski. I am the National Program Senior Manager here at FAIR, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's presentation. Um, today's webinar, called Families Preparing for a Safe Freshman Food Allergy Experience, uh, will cover the steps that families can take to ensure a safe college experience and we'll also include topics such as college selection, pre-planning with dining services, um, how to request accommodations, working with roommates and resident advisors, uh, understanding the status of stock epinephrine on college campuses, and a lot, lot more. Um, so just a quick little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This presentation is going to be recorded and posted on the FAIR website in about seven to ten days. Um, please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. However, um, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can always use the questions and chat features in the GoToWebinar toolbar that should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Lastly, um, there is so much to cover today, but I will let you know if we do have time at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to respond to some moderated questions um, for our presenter. So moving on to, um, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Beth Winthrop. Beth has had a long career as a clinical nutrition manager and dietetic internship director for Sodexo Healthcare, spending the past eight years with Sodexo Universities. For Sodexo Universities, Beth developed the My Zone Personal Pantry, the Sodexo Simple Servings, the Allergen Safe Resident Dining Option, which won Food Management's 2013 Best Wellness Concept, and the 2017 Allertrain Best Food Allergy Innovation for Universities Award. Um, after contributing to the development of the FAIR Pilot Food Allergy Program for Higher Education, Beth spoke at FAIR's College Summit in April 2014, the FAIR National Conference in, 20, in June 2014, Culinary Intelligence Summit in June 2014, the National Association of College and University Food Services um, National Conference in July of 2014, Cater Source in 2015, and then again the NACUF Southeastern Regional Conference in March 2016. Beth has worked individually with many students and families and with operators to develop individualized meal plans and has assisted families in determining which colleges under consideration are best suited to their needs. So we are so happy to have her with us today, and at this time I'm delighted to turn the presentation over to Beth. Thank you so much, and I'm very, very glad to be here with all of you today. And a lot of you might recognize um, a picture like this from being on one of the fair walks. Um, so these are all a wonderful family of children with food allergies. I am also a food allergy mom and a food allergy auntie. Uh, so this is all very close to my heart as well. So here's the agenda. I could very easily have talked about this for three hours because there's just so much. Um, so I will try to uh, move right along and try to save some time for questions at the end. But we're going to talk about why are the college years dangerous. Obviously, they're leaving the nest. Uh, what do students want because it's all about them. Uh, some steps to try to find the right college or narrow it down. Uh, understanding a little bit about meal plans, some of the resources for finding colleges, including some of the wonderful FAIR resources, uh, how to plan your visit, what questions you might want to ask. Again, lots of information on the FAIR website. Um, I want you to understand a little bit about operations and dining systems so that you can kind of understand the other side of the fence, and then a quick update on stock epinephrine. So as we all know, there has been a very big increase in food allergies, so that is bad and that we have a lot more people with food allergies, but I think the message has finally gotten across that this is a very important topic, and I don't talk to operators like I used to some years ago who said, oh, you know, we don't have any food allergic uh, students on our campus, because we know that that is not true. 
So why is college age a dangerous age for people with food allergies? Um, they are, again, leaving the nest. They don't have their mom and dad reminding them about their uh, EpiPen every single morning. They're not preparing their own food. Sometimes they do dangerous things like just trying something, maybe thinking it'll be okay. And to me and to operators, the scariest statistic on this slide is that only 25% of college students tell us that they have allergies. So for 75%, that means they're kind of winging it, trying to figure it out on their own and not making use of systems to help them. And of course, they may wind up in the emergency room. So this is, I'm sorry, an old slide, but basically looking at how often people are going to carry their epinephrine and some of the times when they might uh, forget to do that, including if they haven't had a recent reaction. So university dining to me is basically a bridge. So when you're in your house uh, with mom and dad and siblings and whoever, um, you're not going to have the things that you're allergic to even probably enter the door of your house. Um, but in a restaurant with chefs that are busy, have very small prep space, may not be trained, may not particularly care, that is a, a potentially dangerous situation. University dining is not your mom, but it's also not um, a, you know, a chef who doesn't care about you. So I think it is a really good transitional period, just like college is a transitional period for sort of everything else. So these slides are from the FAIR Summit in 2014, where we had a lot of food allergic college students and brainstorming and everybody talking together. It was uh, probably the best meeting I've ever been to in my life, so thank you, FAIR. But this is what students actually said. They want to be normal. They really hate going to disability services. They don't feel like they have a disability, and they don't want to have to tell people right away that they have a food allergy. They want to have a normal social life. They want to date. They want to kiss people. They want to be able to go home at Thanksgiving their freshman year and say, I told you, Mom, I'd be fine. I'm fine. And they also know that college is hard. So they were the smartest kid in high school, and now they're going to a competitive college. They may not be the smartest kid. So there's a lot for them to do, just like everybody else, and they don't want dealing with their allergy to take a whole lot of time and put them potentially at a competitive disadvantage. They say to us, to operators, living with food allergies is not fun. They're not asking for stuff just to make our lives more difficult in dining. They need to know now. They need a meal now. It's urgent. They want to be safe and they want to have the same opportunities at college as everybody else. And they don't want their food allergy to define them. They don't want their only choice of a roommate to be somebody with a peanut allergy because they may be incompatible in other ways. So students to operators say, be transparent with us. We'll be transparent with you. Tell us the ingredients. Let the chef talk to us. Let us see the packages. Um, don't restrict everything. So don't say, gee, if you have an allergy, you must also be a you know, vegan uh, person on a kosher diet. Don't make like a all other kind of category for dining. Um, but one thing I think students, particularly upperclassmen, really said was that being in college is being part of a community and everybody needs something. So maybe someone has a sick parent and they're at college dealing with that. Um, maybe they have English as a second language. They're dealing with that. So a food allergy is something you need to deal with, but you're in a community where everybody's got something. Again, these um, slides are from a, a wonderful um, conference from, uh, from FAIR 2014. Um, I think one of the things that's definitely that you know, every parent and every food allergic student knows that food allergy does not go with spontaneity. Everything has to take extra planning and that can definitely weigh on quality of life. This particular slide has really been important for me to understand and I've talked to many, many, many food allergy parents, and I am a food allergy parent. What we fear is our student dying. That's our number one fear. Uh, and, oh my gosh, let me see. Do not reboot, computer. Do not reboot. Okay, I think we're all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so parents fear that student dying. What the student themselves 
fear is social isolation. So that is just something that we need to remember when we're trying to make this all work for the student is we need to keep them socially intact and included as well as safe. Safety is obviously number one, but inclusion is a close second. So what do parents need from dining services? We're not talking about the students right now, talking about the parents. Look at dining during normal hours, busy hours. See if there's an online menu that you can see from home. So maybe you can talk to your student about what they're going to eat, what they're going to do if they need that support from you. Obviously, we need to have food labeling with allergens, um, full ingredients if possible. That is not um, necessarily always there. We can talk more about that. And then you want to have a point person in the department. So somebody that is the main person making the one-on-one -on -one plans for your student. Oftentimes that would be the executive chef. Campuses with dietitians that adds a whole nother layer of safety to me. Um, and uh, I really think it's important to think about accommodations and what can be done prior to the date where you're required to accept that um, college. That was actually, um, Lily has a beautiful, beautiful WebEx that's taped on the FAIR website, which I love. Um, but the one thing I disagree with her on is she feels like, oops, let me get back here. She feels like you shouldn't disclose the food allergy um, before you're admitted. And I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think the chances are about zero that somebody from dining is going to call admissions and say, hey, you know, don't accept Beth Winthrop. Her accommodations are too much. I don't feel like doing that. So uh, that, that's not the kind of relationship that exists between dining and admissions. So I, I just wouldn't even think about that. I would tell the truth to dining um, so that you can make a really comfortable, good decision. So how do you choose the right college? Again, uh, Lily's slideshow on, on the uh, FAIR site has really great student perspective about this, but you need to think about all the other things about colleges, academics, what does it cost, where is it located, and really, you know, what do you want to major in, what's good for that, all those things. Then you want to take your big long list and cut it down to a shorter list for what's realistic for you. And then maybe start looking at the university websites and dining websites, looking at the fair and other databases, planning your visits really um, well. And then once you've made your decision, then you get in touch ahead of time, get that plan in place, and good communication is essential. So NAU and Fairfield University, two very, very early adopters of simple servings, um, nice choices for food allergy families. So this is Lily's um, WebEx that I've been referring to. Again, this is from the student perspective. She taped this when she was at Pitt and does a very nice job. So here's an example. Again, this is Pitt. If you just go to the main university webpage, go to uh, the search bar, just put in food allergy and see what comes up. Hopefully you're, you're being referred over to dining and dining has a little bit of information with that central point of contact and also with what they do for people with food allergies. Uh, generally, uh, gluten-free would be covered in the same way. So here's Liberty University. They are very proud of what they've done around special dietary needs. They um, won a number of awards. They talk about what they do, and they're really featuring that on their, their webpage, which is excellent. And this is actually on the university webpage, not the dining webpage, which is even more impressive. Um, here's William and Mary, and you can see that they have information on meal plan petitions and also how they feel about meal plan petitions, which is that medically restrictive diets, including food allergies, can be accommodated. Um, and they have a full-time campus dietitian who's marvelous, by the way, and they have a process and they really have it uh, figured out. Also probably the most beautiful campus in the world. Harvard is not too shabby in terms of how campuses look as well. 
Um, so again, they are talking about their meal plans. Um, and, and don't assume that colleges are going to grant a waiver for a mandatory meal plan. Um, you know, most people wouldn't ask for waivers from most other mandatory things. But you can see on this Harvard website why, why they really care, why they want people on their meal plan. They understand, just like all other colleges, really understand that the dining environment is one of the places that people make friends. Uh, lifelong friends are definitely one of the things that keep you engaged with that college, which is definitely what they, they want. So Harvard University has some good information on food allergies and special dietary needs on their website. So they give you some central points of contact. Uh, they give you the chef and disability services. So again, really good information on that website. So many times I have conversations with students or parents talking about why are meal plans so expensive. And I think one thing we feel proud of is if you look around dining and you see like the mailmen that are <laughs> eating in resident dining, that's always a good sign. That means they find really good value, um, good food for the money in that dining hall. So looking at the, the sort of uh, guest rate that you can come into dining for, compare that to what would be in a restaurant, and I think that sometimes gives a little bit more perspective. But the meal plan includes construction, the building, the heating, the water, the lighting, the gas for running the equipment, includes staff out front that you see, but also staff in the back preparing the food and doing all the cleanup. There's also an element of food waste, so if you're cooking at home for your student, you're probably only making one meal, um, whereas dining is making a lot of different meals and hoping that the forecast is, is correct for how much they're going to need of, of everything. Also, I think if you look at maybe a meal might cost $7 in resident dining, and if it's an all-you-care-to-eat type of resident dining setup, you might be able to get a glass of milk, a salad, a beautiful chicken dish, a nice piece of pie, and a banana or a piece of fruit to take with you out the door. Of course, if you have food allergies, you're going to have to do some work on uh, all those things to make sure that they are okay. But basically, looking at the cost, um, you can get a lot in an all-you-care-to-eat environment for a meal. Whereas, if um, students are provided with cash, um, they can save their money by just eating ramen noodles, and then who knows what they're going to use the rest of that money for. So meal plans do assure parents that your child can eat a nice meal when, you know, whenever. So unlimited meal plans do, at least for freshmen, provide that sort of safety blanket. So other ways to look and see what colleges might be really focused on being safe for food allergic students, the FAIR database is um, marvelous. So here are three colleges that are on the FAIR database that I actually worked with all three, uh, Fairfield in Connecticut, Framingham State University in Massachusetts, which is um, has a beautiful, beautiful setup. Um, George Mason was one of the original pilot um, universities in this project. So the green dots mean that those are, you know, in place and you can look, you can click on each university and see a little bit more information. So that yellow um, half dot means that some of the guidelines for colleges are in place but not all. So a lot of times that sort of half dot is because there's a question about retail. And retail tends to be much less focused on um, food allergy safety than resident dining. So the pilot guidelines for higher education, or I, I don't know if they're still called the pilot ones, but the FAIR guidelines, FAIR College Food Allergy Program is on the FAIR website. That will give you a good understanding of some of the operational things that should be in place. There's also some wonderful colleges in Canada, and Food Allergy Canada has a guide for post-secondary institutions, again, on managing food allergies. Um, so that is in place, and they have some nice material on their website as well. So if you look on the FAIR website, this is the link um, going to college, and there are terrific resources here for future college students, lots of information, including information about 
what conversations you should have, what questions when you're visiting um, different departments on the college campus. So this is just an example of, woo, sorry. Let me get back here a little bit. Okay, uh, this is, oh. <laughs> Oh, only when I'm being taped, right? Okay, so this is an example from the FAIR website of some of the things you can think about doing while you're still in high school to sort of practice what college is going to be like. So communication, if you're going to a restaurant, really working on running the show. Hopefully, um, for most food allergy families, you have a restaurant or two where you are a regular and they understand what to do and you trust them. Um, thinking ahead, asking questions. Um, am I allowed to bring my own mini fridge so I have that myself, private microwave, things like that. Um, and also just trying to think about being a little more independent to practice uh, for going to college. Maybe researching a restaurant ahead of time. There are other databases that can be helpful to you. Uh, Allergic Living has a college directory. I'm not sure how updated it is, but that is helpful at least to give you some places to start. And then Kitchens with Confidence is um, a company that is part of Menu Trinfo, which other do off also does Allertrain. So these are campuses where they've had on-site inspections, monthly reporting, and they are accountable for some free from areas. So just to give you an example, Cornell University in rainy Ithaca, New York, um, has certified a whole dining hall, Risley Dining Hall, which is beautiful, from free from peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, and gluten. There's some other information about, about Cornell, including that there is a master trainer on site and for how long they have done Allertrain certification training for their staff, which is since 2015. So they have four years under their belt of really committing to training. So if you want to see colleges where Allertrain um, has been delivered to that college, you can just click on what state you might be interested in and see which colleges have had the Aller train training. Um, this website is getting um, blown out a lot so that there is more detail. How many people, how long ago, do they have a trainer on site, all those things. So that can really give you a good amount of information. So if you're going to plan to visit campuses, which you definitely, definitely should plan to do, that's good to do your junior year when school is in session, the summer between your junior and senior year, although that is just a little bit late and also you're not going to see things in full uh, working order. So you want to feel the fit of the campus in general. Um, you may think it's great for food allergies, but you hate it for a lot of other reasons. That's fine. That's good to know. Look at the logistics. So where's the nearest hospital? What's the status of off-campus housing? If you really want your student to, to have their own kitchen, their own apartment, off-campus, that kind of thing, look and see what the off-campus housing is like. Where are the supermarkets? What about public transportation? Are they gonna let your student have a car on campus? Kind of um, look at what what their housing looks like um, and do arrange previous you know prior to your visit for one-on-one -on -one meetings you definitely want to meet with the executive chef or dietitian whoever the central point of contact is in dining you want to meet with disability services if they're involved um, some colleges they are not at all involved um, maybe student health services maybe resident life and if there is a special station i'll tell you a little more about simple servings but if you have something like that um, ask the chef if you can have a meal there and you know see what the staff is like and see how the students feel about it so I would sort of caution you to kind of manage your expectations about what can be possible and I think just in thinking about it the more special one-on-one -on -one, you know meal made only for your student type of meals that are being prepared the less that student is socially integrated. So it actually really helps your son or daughter uh, if there's a station and they can just kind of go get a meal, know what's gonna be in there, know what's not gonna be in there, 
have a server or a chef that's familiar to them, but they can kind of be seamless because every other student can go as well. So will your student have the same exact number of food choices as any other student without any pre-planning? No, that is not going to happen. And that's also not going to happen in a restaurant. So that's okay. Um, do you want to make sure that there are options at every single retail outlet? Probably not. Uh, if you are not allergic, you really don't want to get used to eating in Indian restaurants because they're not going to be safe for you. Um, can you have safe one-on-one -on -meal, one -on -one meals available anytime in any place? Again, probably not. There's definitely settings where the production space is super tiny, where it's just not going to be safe. Can your student eat just the brands that they are familiar with at home? Probably not. So most uh, college food services have particular brands that they order, particular, particular distribution houses um, that they may order from. And for a lot of the food allergy safe recipes that we do, it's all scratch cooking. So we're not going to use, you know, bottled sauces and this and that anyway. Of course, you are more than welcome to give them lots of care packages of the things that they, they really like. And one one request I've had for a lot of parents, from a lot of parents, that I think is, is not a good idea is I want my student to be able to manage their food allergies without telling anybody, talking to anybody, letting anybody know. Um, I would strongly recommend that um, being transparent and having it be a partnership is really a much better way to go than saying, well, they don't, you know, they don't want to tell anybody. So just a couple of things that are non-dining types of things. Um, doesn't hurt to call the fire chief and kind of see what the deal is with how they respond to the university. Again, you're going to search food allergy on the university websites. Ask the student tour guides. Um, they may not know, but it's good for them to hear the question um, because we, we always try to train the student tour guides and sometimes we're not allowed to do that. Um, same with resident advisors. Know, your, know the status of the state where the university is that you're visiting <coughs> in terms of stock epinephrine. And then some of the catered events. See if, they, see if you can kind of find out about what the process is to ask ahead of time and see if anybody has food allergies. Sorry. So again, on the FAIR website on that, um, college student page. There are many, many good questions for you to discuss with disability services. Just be aware that disability services in some schools very, very, very involved, in other schools not involved at all. It's good to have disability services included because there are some things which are not within dining's control. So if somebody does need a single room, a room with a kitchen, those sorts of things, um, that is beyond dining's ability to do, so that is a disability services thing. It's good to ask if they thought at all about peer support or mentoring, if somebody is in touch with the EMTs. Uh, medical alert bracelets are always a smart idea, and there's some very cute ones these days. Um, and then really the biggest question, no matter what department you're in, is talking about how the departments are coordinated how they share information and work together. So just one example of a peer support network um, that you may or may not be aware of is the College Diabetes Network. Definitely challenging. We have a lot of college students with type 1 diabetes. Um, I've talked to a number of families where the diabetes was diagnosed like between uh, fall and spring semesters, freshman year. So that is uh, very scary for those parents as well. One thing I like on the College Diabetes Network is they actually have some scripting for requesting a meeting and some of the things I would like to discuss with you. So those aren't the same exact things, but I think the approach is good and having that peer support is really good. So we talked about this a little bit before, but thinking about how your student can be empowered how we can start turning over the keys in junior high school and high school. Um, and I think one thing that Lily talks about in her WebEx that is great is that, you know, zero, 
zero reactions in four years may or may not be um, a realistic goal. So safety is the first priority, but preparedness is the second priority. Um, all right, so I think that's good. So let's talk a little bit about what we do in dining. What are some of the things we do operationally to try to create that safe environment for food allergic students? So we need to understand our ingredients and we need to watch for any substitutions. So everybody in the department has to be in on this. The person that's probably gonna notice the substitutions the most is actually gonna be the guy who receives the shipments on the loading dock. So that's a person that needs to be trained reading labels i have a lot of questions from operators saying well this food says may contain what am i supposed to do about that and basically what i say is if you have a label like that or if you call the company and they explain their procedure just be as transparent as you possibly can for our special um, stations like simple servings we would not use something with may contain but for other areas in the um, dining venue that would be uh, what we would do so we need to make sure the recipe is printed and followed. We need to take steps to avoid cross contact in the back of the house, which is our preparation area, the front of the house, which is where we are serving your students. And we need to make sure foods are labeled correctly and that our staff is trained. So there are some areas in the front of the house, like the salad bar, where it is virtually impossible to avoid cross contact. You know, we can't stand there and just say, oh, oh, don't use that spoon from the cottage cheese and the cucumbers, put that back. So if your student is allergic to something like milk, which is really prevalent on the salad bar, then part of their one-on-one -on -one plan is, let us know what you like in your salad and we're gonna make you your salad from the back of the house where nothing has been in a self-serve environment. So these are some of the options for food service systems. And if you do visits, you will probably see all of these. So there may be a pantry system with limited access. So there may be a key or a key code um, that has advantages because only students with food allergies are allowed in there. Um, the disadvantage may be that a lot of it is uh, prepackaged food, not fresh, not freshly made hot food. And students also may be embarrassed. I've seen a couple of them that are glassed in, which I think is just, you know, makes you kind of look like you're in the zoo. So I really, I really don't like that. Um, open access systems, so I think especially with gluten-free breads and gluten-free toasters, many times those are open access where that does uh, increase your chances of cross-contact. If there are areas where vegan items are offered in conjunction as like the all special items refrigerator, um, that is not a safe situation with nut allergic people because many of the vegan items are very full of nuts. Uh, almond milk, almond cheeses, things like that. So be careful if you see an area where it's like all the special stuff, including vegan stuff and allergy stuff. Um, chef prepares meal to order is a good option, especially for a small place. Um, and that can be worked out. We do a lot of that in um, independent schools that are, that are high schools, um, that you can have a really nice relationship with the chef. The problem with that is, again, people may be embarrassed, they may be slowed down by that, and they may not get to eat their friends, not eat with their friends. So that um, can be socially isolating for them. Um, a hot food station with limited access, I actually really don't like that at all either. That would be like a steam table behind a locked door. Um, you're not going to have the traffic in there to really keep the food turning over again. It, it may be embarrassing. Um, so all of those options have their, their pros and cons. There's lots of creative solutions. Uh, at Holy Cross, you can order, pre-order your meal one of three ways. You can order it hot and ready to eat. You can order it refrigerated. You could take it with you or you can order it hot uh, to go to eat somewhere else. So that's creative and I think Holy Cross does, does a nice job as well. Um, in Sodexo, there are a number of resources, programs available. There's a food allergy toolkit with policies and training and signage. Um, you can always do a one-on-one -on -one pre-plan, look at the menu, talk about what you're going to do, 
you know, Tuesday we have baked fish, but it has breadcrumbs on it, so we're going to make you plain baked fish and so forth. Uh, my zone would be one of those pantries, either uh, limited access or not. That always needs to go with, with some hot, freshly prepared food. We do have some just plain gluten-free stations, and then we have simple servings. So my zone, again, it's uh, less restricted, gluten-free, peanut and tree nut free, um, can be limited access and so forth. So simple servings is um, the best wellness concept in 2013, five other national awards. Um, to me, that is great. The thing that really means more to me though is I feel like the parent groups um, really know what simple servings is and you know appreciate how it works. So that's the big deal to me. Here's an example of the simple serving station at University of Idaho. One thing we do there that's really fun is they have a dietetic internship program for postgraduate dietetic students, and they all work for a couple of weeks at Simple Serving so they can really understand how it all works. Uh, here's another example of a Simple Serving station. You can see that it is somewhat set aside from other stations, that you don't have a lot of traffic from other places going behind the station, um, which is important. And one thing I like on this simple serving station, which isn't quite as fancy as some of the others, but they've really taken pride in posting their Our Train U certificates right on the wall so that you can see that the people that work there have been trained. So in brief, simple servings is resident dining, lunch and dinner. Um, it eliminates gluten. It also eliminates seven of the big eight allergens. The only big eight allergen that is allowed would be thin fish and that would only be served as a piece of recognizable fish, like a piece of salmon, a piece of cod. We wouldn't use like Asian fish sauce or anything like that. We also would take a lot of precautions back in front of the house to minimize cross contact. So just some of the other things you might want to think about catering, uh, athlete travel meals. If you do have somebody on a sports team or using the weight room, um, that's something to really go to those areas, take a look and see what's available. Are there peanut butter crackers all over the place or something else that would be dangerous? Um, summer camps, orientation before um, all the upperclassmen come. This is just a poster showing that central point of contact person within dining. So that's definitely something that may be on the website or you want to ask about if you visit. Uh, this is a nice thing just to say if you are a visitor, if you're coming for like accepted student day or whatever, just a little card to say, gee, if you do have food allergies, we would like to talk to you before the semester starts to make sure that we have a plan for you. So this is the Bite app for Sodexo. It does allow you to look at uh, the menus all over campus, along with nutritionals and allergens for each item. Um, there's also what I think is cool, it's a like real-time customer satisfaction survey. So if you had something for lunch, you think it's wonderful, you don't think it's wonderful, you can actually comment on it in real time. And we also would have the menu um, online, as many people do, and then you're going to see um, cards or signs uh, in the dining hall. So if you see a sign like this in the dining hall, this would be a sort of Sodexo icons and so forth. So the little V sign means it's vegetarian. Um, the little kind of apple heart looking thing means it's mindful, so that's a healthy item. And then at the bottom, you can see the allergens. So if you're looking at this, you're like, gee, I make Israeli couscous at home all the time. I understand why it would have wheat and gluten, but I don't understand why it would have soy. So probably that soy is either coming from margarine in the recipe or a soup base in the recipe. So again, it's good to think about this and have your student think about it because if you make Israeli couscous at home and you just make it with water, maybe they're gonna assume that that's gonna be fine. That's not necessarily the case. So we do wanna look at the information that's provided. So again, if you are 
it wouldn't be for, for couscous because that's gluten containing, but perhaps for um, quinoa, uh, quinoa can be prepared with just a canola oil or an olive oil, a soup base that does not have allergens. The RC Fine Food soup bases do not have any allergens. Um, so it's possible to make dishes just very slightly tweaking the ingredients that are much safer. So cross contact is really, really something that we work hard on both back in front of the house in terms of allergen safety. We don't say cross contamination usually. Cross contamination to us in food service really means microorganisms. So for instance, if you get raw chicken, I think everybody knows that raw chicken is a little bit of a risk for salmonella, whether we're cooking it or you're cooking it at home. Our final cooking temperature for raw chicken is 165 degrees because we know that will kill salmonella. So that is a situation of looking at cross-contamination. Maybe that chicken juice can uh, you know, touch some other food that might not get to 165 degrees. Cross-contact is different and we need to re make really sure that our staff understands it's different because there is no temperature hot enough to kill allergens. So whenever we're doing training for allergen safety, we make sure we differentiate between allergens traveling from one food to another food and maybe microorganisms because what we do about it is, is different. All right. Okay, so one of the things we do to prevent cross contact, gosh, I am so sorry, hold on one second. One of the things we do to prevent cross contact um, in our back of the house areas is we would use the purple small wares that you've probably seen. Um, the, there's nothing magical about the color purple, um, but it does help to remind us to keep all those utensils separate. So that's something that you probably would see in the front of the house in a simple serving station and we would have in the back of the house. Um, for our staff to keep everything separate. I'm gonna leave this stock epinephrine, uh, maybe we'll talk about it now. Um, so stock epinephrine is something that people ask about uh, fairly frequently. As you know, in your own family, epinephrine is prescribed by one doctor for one patient. Uh, states have different rules and laws about how stock epinephrine works. So stock epinephrine obviously is not for one patient, um, just like the EpiPens or whatever that you buy, it does outdate, so that needs to be checked. Um, we do have to really train people on what to do about it. I really like this emergency kit box, which you can open with a key, but you can also like break the glass and get in that way if the key uh, cannot be located quickly. And obviously, stock epinephrine can save lives. So on the FAIR website, you can go to the Advocacy Action Center, um, and you can see a list of all the status in every different state. So not only in the state that you live, but the state that you might be visiting colleges in. And then there is also information about the actual universities um, and their access to epinephrine. All right, well, I really did talk fast here. That's very good. Um, and I, I wanna let you know that I really appreciate all of you being on the call today. Uh, I appreciate what you are going through and how brave you all are to send off your college student. I remember crying like a baby when I brought my daughter to college and um, she wasn't even too far away and her food allergies were very, um, very manageable. So this is a, a big thing you're doing, sending your students on their way. Um, and hopefully you'll have a really good trip and visit and talk with dying services and have a good one-on-one -on -one plan for your student and you'll you'll feel good about that and then you'll have to worry about all the things that all the other parents worry about um, so let's see um, we do have a good 15 minutes for Q&A so that's nice and I'm going to ask myself a question because <laughs> there was something I forgot to put a slide in about 
And that is, uh, what about alcohol in college? And I think Lily in her WebEx has a nice uh, slide about that. So alcohol is kind of a reality about the college social scene. And it's definitely something that needs to be talked about with your teen students as they go to college or even if they're in high school. Uh, alcohol can include allergenic ingredients to start with, and it can also reduce the inhibitions that would cause you to say, oh, I don't know if that's onion dip or clam dip, but I'm going to just try it and hope that it's onion dip because I'm allergic to clams. So you definitely want to have that, that conversation because that is something that is, that is going to come up. Do we have any questions at all? I'm not seeing any in the chat box. Yeah, Beth, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate that. That was a ton of great information. Um, you are such an expert. So, um, again, thank you for being here. And we do have some questions. Luckily, I've got my colleague, Christy Grimm, who's the director of our college program right next to me, and she's been um, fielding a lot of these questions that have come through the, through the chat box. But there's a couple that I'd love your advice on. Um, we, we have one from a listener, and the question asks, um, what is your first step or your first point of contact when you're considering a college? Like, where do you first start? Um, is it disability services, dining services? Who should that first conversation be with? Well, what I would do as a very first step is I would go to the college website, type in food allergy in the search bar and see what comes up. And that will give you a little bit of information about do they have a process that goes through disability services? If it were me, what the person I would start with would be the general manager of dining, and I would just call up and say, hey, uh, this is Mrs. Winthrop. My daughter, Jen, is uh, looking at coming to your university. She has multiple food allergies, and I'd really like to talk to you about what your systems are for food allergic students. Because you can assume that everybody has at least thought of it a little bit before, and I think the response you get from the general manager will be really, really helpful. Um, so I know many colleges want you to start in disability services, and that's fine. But, you know, if the general manager in dining says, oh, well, we don't have a system because we don't have anybody here with food allergies, uh, you can kind of cross that place off your list regardless of what disability services says because the general manager is not on board. It would be very unlikely that anybody would say that to you. But, I mean, that's, that's where I would start because it would allow you to, to rule somewhere, to rule someplace out. Right. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, we got a couple questions um, in the house of dining or kind of the dining hall. Um, how do you adjust signs for students um, if there was a substitution and the allergen information has changed? That's a great question. So first of all, if we're talking about simple servings, um, that would never happen. Um, they, would not, they wouldn't serve that dish if there was a substitution. They would serve another approved recipe. Now, if there's, say there's a run out and we have a corn tortilla dish somewhere and we ran out of corn tortillas and we're gonna replace them with a wheat tortilla, when I do the Aller Train U training, which I've done for thousands and thousands of managers and chefs, I say, look, just pull that little Sharpie pen that you have out of your pocket and just change the sign with the Sharpie right in real time. Then if you want to get the marketing person to print out a pretty looking sign, you can, but make sure that the sign is correct in real time. So that's what I tell people, but I haven't trained everybody in the world. So what I would recommend doing is look at the item if you're a student and see if it kind of makes sense. So look at the item. Does it look like it has melted cheese all over it and you're allergic to milk, even though there's not milk on the sign? Um, you know, take, take a look and then ask. So if you're at that, that allergy station, like a simple serving station, in general, you can assume that that signage is going to be correct and that the person who's serving you is going to give you the correct information. But there are 50 other choices of things within that dining venue. So 
so you're going to have to be alert and you're going to have to talk to people. That's one of the reasons that Simple Servings is nice is because it gives you an area where you don't have to ask questions all the time. Wonderful. And just kind of a follow-up to that and speaking of Simple Servings, how can, how can people find out which schools have Simple Servings? Is that information online or...? Um, it's going to be online. I believe they're working on like a external simple servings page that will help you locate them. Um, my email is Beth Winthrop at Yahoo. If you're looking like in a particular state or particular geography and you want to drop me an email and say, hey, I'm looking, you know, is there some place here or there? Um, or if you want to say, I'm interested in these five schools. You know, do any of them are are any of them known to you? Um, I will I will do that for you. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, switching gears just a little bit, we had a few questions come in about Sesame, and I'm wondering if, mm -hmm. if any of your years, or all your expertise, do you have any recommendations for students with Sesame allergy? Yes. So if you are going to a school with simple servings and you have a Sesame allergy. What we do when we are in good communication with students is we will take Sesame out of Simple Servings as well. Um, thanks to our friends in Canada who are sensible enough to have Sesame in their top allergens, our database actually does show Sesame as an ingredient because we share recipes with Canada. Um, I personally wrote a letter, as I'm sure many, many of you did, urging that Sesame be added to the, the big eight allergens. Um, it's hard because just the way it is for you at home, it can be in natural flavorings, it can be in seasonings, um, and you can't, it might not necessarily have sesame printed on the label. So, you know, scratch cooked items, talk to the chef. A sesame allergy is difficult to manage. Um, one thing I learned when I went to Canada is that almost every single commercial bread that's sold in the United States, when you look at the label in Canada, shows a sesame allergen. I'm sure you know that because I'm sure you've been making your bread at home, just like my sister does, because her daughter's sesame allergic. So it's, that's not an easy one. Hopefully it will get better. But if you are somewhere that has a special allergy station, like a Simple Servings, I would ask them to also ban sesame from that station. And for simple servings, there's only a very small, you know, maybe two or three recipes that would be there that would have sesame anyway. Wonderful. Thank you. That's great advice. Um, we're going to, can we talk about alcohol a little bit again? We actually had uh, yeah. a couple questions come in about it. And what is your advice or do you have any suggestions as to how, um, a student should approach that. I know it's such a such a big part of you know going away to college. And if you have any kind of suggestions, well, I mean honestly, my suggestion is stay sober um, because the risks are just big risks. You know, if people are all drinking out of common uh, common vessels, you might have somebody that's been eating peanuts. If you know, if you're drunk, you may lose the ability to care about things, lose the ability to say, you know, I'm not falling down drunk. I'm in anaphylaxis. I just think it's a very risky thing. So I guess my actual advice would be to give give them some grown-up advice. Like, hey, I know you want to seem like you're drinking, um, but, you know, get seltzer water and put a lime in it or, you know, bring that in your pocket or bring it in your purse so that you look like you are drinking a gin and tonic, but actually you are just drinking seltzer water. And then, you know, people like to have a designated driver or somebody to help them and you might be that guy and that's not always the most fun thing, um, but it might make you a trusted friend and it's just, it's just dangerous. And I, I know agree. if you listen to Lily's WebEx, she'll basically say the same thing of just like, you need to be in control of the situation. You need to not, you know, not look like a drunk person when actually you're fighting for your life. Yeah, I was actually just about to suggest um, listening to Lily's webinar again because it really is a great perspective from a student. And she talks about all of those issues like dating and yep. kissing and parties and alcohol. So um, yep. definitely recommend the parents on the call to share that with their teens. So thank you. 
Um, if I can, yeah, and again, I love, I oh, love, love, I love the Lily's WebEx. I think it's great. The only thing she says, which I really do fairly strongly disagree with, is not to disclose the food allergy because it might affect whether you get admitted. And I really, I mean, I have never talked to a general manager that it would ever in a million years occur to them to call up missions and say, don't take this kid. Never. So, you know, talk, talk to the general manager, feel comfortable about your decision for that school. I agree with that. And, and fair also does as well. So thanks for pointing out, pointing out that difference. Um, we got a question. How do you handle a dining manager who says they cannot guarantee the food is safe? Uh, to me, a lot of times that's a training issue. And a lot of times that also is a conversation that you can help manage. So if you put yourself in an adversarial type of way, and I get it. I know you're the mama bear. You're defending your young. I completely get the hormones and the feelings about it. But if you say to a food service manager, can you guarantee that this is going to be okay? They're going to say no, no. So if you kind of ask them for that language, that's going to be how they react. Now, if you say to them, let's talk about all the different ways that you and your staff really work to make this environment as safe as possible. And, and, you know, something that I've had parents say to me that really like just touched my heart is for parents to say, you know what, we've had food allergy reactions on our watch. We know we've had to do a lot of things. We've learned a lot. It's been a process, but let's work together to try to make it as safe as possible. And we'll also make sure our student is as prepared as possible. So it's scary from an operator perspective to be asked for a guarantee because then you're thinking like, well, you know, what if something absolutely crazy happens? What if someone decides to like throw almond milk all around the storeroom and nobody knows it happened? So crazy, crazy things could happen. We're never going to be a thousand percent there, but it's important to have that conversation saying, look, we have the same goal and we're not asking you for a guarantee. We're just asking you to share with us all the measures you take, because I know, I know you don't want my kids to have a reaction in your dining hall. That's the last thing you want. That's the last thing I want. We're on the same team. So I think that if you're getting that kind of pushback, it could just be like a conversation problem or a training problem. Or, I mean, you're going to have to judge it and use your own best judgment. It could be someone being a jerk. But in general, it's not. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I think we have time for just one more question. And to everybody that's been sending in their questions, um, if you don't mind emailing them to collegeprogram at foodallergy.org. Again, that's collegeprogram at foodallergy.org. Uh, myself or um, my colleague can get an answer back to you, and we can even reach out to Beth after this webinar um, to get her advice. So um, if you have a question and we haven't gotten to it, again, please email us. And then, Beth, the last one for you is kind of similar to the question um, we had about sesame. A uh, few people were asking, you know, what about other allergens outside of the top eight, you know, such as sesame? Do you have any just overall recommendations for students with allergies, allergens that fall out of the top eight? Yes. And sometimes they're easier because they're ingredients that we don't use very much. So if you're allergic to lobster, we can't afford lobster in resident dining. So you're going to be all set. If you're allergic to something a little more common, maybe you're allergic to um, red bell pepper um, or cilantro. The best thing for you to do is if it is like a, a simple serving station and you have multiple allergens, you can just ask the chef, hey, can we not use red bell peppers in any of the recipes? Um, because I'm also allergic to those that may be able to, to happen or you can just talk to the chef and to some extent you you know say you're allergic to crab um, you're probably going to be able to tell from the recipes well that would show as a shellfish allergen anyway so not crab but I don't know many times you're going to be able to tell from the recipe or the recipe name that it might have your allergen in it. And I guess the answer to that question and the answer to every single question is 
good communications. Work with the chef, take a look at the menu every Sunday night, decide you know, where you're gonna be and what you might like to eat, and then shoot the chef one message and say, hey, I read the menu. Tuesday lunch, I'd like to have you know, chicken parmesan. Could you just check there's no red pepper in that for me? Thursday dinner, I'd like to have the, you know, tilapia with Mediterranean vegetables. Could you see if there's red pepper in that? Uh, if there is, could you make me a special portion without the vegetable topping? So that is respectful of the chef's time and expertise to say, look, I took my 15 minutes, I looked at the menu, I'm feeling really good about this, but there are a couple of areas where I have questions. And honestly, I have not seen allergic reactions in people that really had that close working relationship and communication. And the great thing about that too for students is, if you have a great relationship with a chef in college, you're really working closely together, at, you know, the same goal and everything, that's an experience that's gonna help you when in adulthood you want to become that regular in a restaurant, you wanna work with the chef to help you get safe meals in a restaurant. So being able to be really friendly and know how to communicate with a chef is probably the biggest, most helpful takeaway message for any college student with food allergies. Perfect. That is such great advice. Um, thank you. On that note and that, you know, expert advice from Beth, I'd like to once again thank her for joining us today and for sharing all of her wisdom um, and experience on a topic that is of great significance to families, teens, colleges. Um, and to FAIR, you know, as part of our mission to improve quality of life um, with these teens that are merging up and going to school, off to school. So as a reminder, today's webinar was recorded, and it's going to be available as a resource on our website in about seven to ten days. And I'm going to send a uh, link out to all registrants. So you'll have a recording in your email box probably in about a week. And then while I have you, I just want to take a quick moment to announce next month's webinar. Um, next month, we're going to build on today's presentation and today's topic and kind of take the subject of managing food allergies on a college or university campus just one step further as we dive into the law and all of the legal protections for post-secondary students with food allergies. Um, we will be joined by our guest speaker, Jim Long. Jim is a former senior attorney with the Office of Civil Rights. U.S. Department of Education in the Denver Regional Office. So registration for uh, Jim's webinar next month is actually open. So if you go to foodallergy.org slash webinars, you can sign up um, for that today. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. A huge thank you to Beth and um, hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you. Thanks very much.